What are atoms? How do they look like? Let's take a look into what we have learned about them and how we think of them. The history of the atom. Part three. You could say this is a video about TV and cake on the surface, but it is about atoms, I swear. <laughs> okay, so this was supposed to be a plum pudding, but I got a panettone instead, because uh, British cuisine, Italian cuisine, not really a contest. And it's essentially the same thing anyway. This is not what atoms look like. But people thought so. For a while. Cathode ray tubes. Uh, this question is maybe more of an how old are you? But do you remember this or this? Yeah, that's what uh, TVs and computer monitors looked like until the 2000s. And the technology behind this was called cathode ray tube or CRT for short. And that's the reason why some people call the TV the tube. And actually that's also the reason for the tube in YouTube. So what is a cathode ray tube? This is what the first CRTs looked like back towards the end of the 19th century when the advances in vacuum generation made them first possible. Uh, essentially you take a glass tube, evacuate the air from it and apply electrical voltage to both ends. You can then observe the cathode rays either when they strike the glass and make it glow, or when you leave enough gas in the tube and make this glow. And after discovering this effect, the next obvious question was, what are these cathode rays made of? People thought it must either be a, a new kind of electromagnetic wave, or some sort of uh, charged particles like ions. And there was some amount of confusion initially because of some misleading experimental results uh, due to insufficient vacuum. But eventually, in 1897, the English physicist J.J. Thomson could show that these cathode rays were diverted both by magnetic fields and electric fields, just as if they were negatively charged particles. And that was an important indication because, you know, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it might just be a duck. It was not possible at the time to directly measure the mass of these supposed particles, which Thomson called the corpuscles, but he did manage to measure the mass per charge, or m over e. This was possible because he could measure the total charge carried by these rays, plus the thermal energy transferred, and the deflection in magnetic field. And if you rearrange these equations, you can get an expression where you can measure everything except the m over e. And that's how he did it. And the fact that these cathode rays had an associated mass to them was finally the deciding factor in favor of the corpuscle theory. Thomson was recognized as having first discovered them and he was awarded the 1906 Nobel Prize for this feat. If you're now scratching your head because you've never heard of these corpuscles before, it might be because their name was changed after the fact. Maybe you have heard of electrons. The plum pudding. Thomson could show that this mass to charge ratio m over e was always the same value, regardless of what cathode material he used or what gas was inside the tube. It was always the same value. Therefore, electrons had to be a constituent of all atoms, of all elements, which was quite a remarkable finding. Remember the very first part of this series? Atom, the name atom, means indivisible. But with the existence of electrons, it became clear that atoms were not indivisible. They had an, an inner structure. They, they had other particles that they consisted of. And just like that, the supposedly indivisible atom had been divided. For the first time. Now, if electrons are inside the atom, how exactly? How, what is their number? How are they arranged inside? First up, electrons are negatively charged particles, while the atoms themselves are electrically neutral. This means that somewhere, somehow inside the atom, there has to be a positive charge to neutralize the electrons. Second, 
the electron's mass to charge ratio could be compared to an atom's mass to charge ratio, which was higher by a factor of about a thousand. Further experiments suggested that their charges were more or less equal, so that this factor of thousand would have to apply to their masses alone. So electrons had to be tiny in comparison to atoms. In 1904, Thomson suggested an atomic model based on this. He assumed that the atom was a homogeneous sphere of positive charge, and the negative electrons were embedded in this like raisins in a plum pudding. Hence, the plum pudding model of the atom. The electrons inside could either be stationary or could be rotating with certain frequencies. For atoms to be stable, they had to be arranged on rings inside the atom, not unlike the later orbital or shell models. Thomson even recognized that these rotating charges within the atom were problematic because According to electrodynamics, a rotating charge would emit radiation and lose all of its charge in less than a second. But he found some configurations where the radiation of several electrons would interfere and almost cancel out completely. So he figured there could be a solution. And this atomic model could explain most of what people knew about atoms back then. The legacy of Thomson's model. But despite its promise, Thomson's plum pudding model was short-lived. It was falsified just a few years later by one of Thomson's former students, Ernest Rutherford. And we will go more into this in the next video, but suffice to say that the plum pudding arrangement was wrong. But still, the most important part of Thomson's legacy was finding the electron and figuring out that it is a part of all atoms. And the only thing he did get wrong was how the electrons are arranged inside the atom. And the electron is a vital part of all atomic models ever since. Essentially, all of chemistry is just what electrons do inside atoms. And actually, it turned out to be the first elementary particle we ever found. It's still there today, right in the standard model of particle physics. It took us from 1897 with the electron up until 2012 with the Higgs boson to find all these particles in experiments. Over a hundred years. And it all started in a cathode ray tube in the 19th century. Just one last thing, because uh, the universe sometimes has a really interesting sense of humor. So, as we said, J.J. Thompson won the Nobel Prize in 1906 for showing the particle nature of electrons. Turns out he had a son called George Paget Thompson, who also became a physicist and who also won a Nobel Prize. This was in 1937 and it was awarded for showing the wave nature of the electron. Because sometimes in physics, the opposite of a truth is another deep truth.